Would you stand with me as I read now the word of the Lord from Luke 21 and beginning in verse 12. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it, therefore, in your minds, not to meditate beforehand how to answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this, another portion of your word, certainly not the easiest one. And yet, Father, with some wonderful promises, tremendous uh, examples of the way that you will eventually and over time overcome the brokenness of a human race which has chosen against you. Thank you for the redemption that allows us to rejoin your side in this struggle that will eventually result in a resounding victory that is beyond anything we can imagine or think. Meantime, sometimes it's tough. And Lord, we need your help to face those times. This morning as we think of all that's going on, even just in our own little congregation here, Father, all the ways in which we see suffering and we see things that are sort of unexplainable, how it could all happen to one family or how it could happened to this little congregation. And so we pray, Father, for your hand of blessing. We pray for your healing touch. We pray that we will, uh, Father, be able to glorify you by life or by death. We pray that we will have the assurance of the salvation that you provide, that we will be trusting in you alone. We pray now that you will lead us as we study your word this morning. Lord, be our teacher. We pray that, Lord, the messenger that you have sent will not be a hindrance in any way. Pray for your forgiveness. And then we pray that your spirit will be freed among us, move among us with power, with challenge, with conviction, with glory. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. May be seated, and uh, if you have not already, please turn to Luke chapter 21. We're studying Jesus' major prophetic sermon. Just about everything he's saying in this sermon is prophetic. Uh, at the time that he said it, some of it has happened, some of it has not at this point in time, uh, but will. It is given, as we've seen, as a corrective to the false hope of his disciples who were expecting certain things to happen immediately, and that was not going to be the case. The disciples were expecting kingdom. They're going to get delay. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with this kind of disappointment? How do you deal with some of the things that Jesus says are coming? Jesus is giving them this information to help the, to realign them with reality rather than fantasy, and along the way, helping them understand how to handle things. So in verses 8 through 33 of this passage, we said we have a re reorientation of hope. Their hope was over here. It needs to be over here. And so Jesus is going to give them five elements of change that are going to happen to help them reorient their hope in the right direction. Last time we were together looking at this passage, we saw the first of those, that there is going to be, in verses 8 through 11 of this passage, a disturbing delay. That's what's coming. It's disturbing 
because they expected the kingdom now and it's not going to happen now. It's disturbing because it's going to be characterized by general signs that we saw these verses represent, 8 through 11, general signs of chaos during the period of time of the church age, during the time from Pentecost until the rapture when Jesus comes again. Now, the second place he takes them is in verses 12 through 19 that we read this morning. This age is going to be also characterized by personal persecution. Personal persecution. Now, in verses 12 through 19, Jesus has done something. He's been talking about general characteristics of the whole age in verses 8 through 11. Verses 12 through 19, he backs up a little bit, and he begins to talk specifically to the disciples about what's going to happen to them prior to the destruction of the temple. There's application for us, but this is specific to the disciples. And in a word, what's going to happen is persecution. You know, reading Jesus' words in this passage reminds me of the prayer of an old saint who prayed, Lord, when will you cease to burden me with all of these trials and thorns. And the Lord answered, well, my son, this is the way I prove my children. To which the old saint answered, well, Lord, maybe this is the reason you don't have so many of them. Could be, right? Could be. But consider this question. Would you rather suffer with Jesus for a short time now. Romans 8. The sufferings of this time are going to eventually seem like nothing. 2 Corinthians 4, same thing. Would you rather suffer for a short time with Jesus now or suffer eternity without him later? That's a tough question, isn't it? Puts a whole different spin on things. And yet it's the question that we all face, suffer with him now or suffer without him forever. Human experience tells us that all suffering is bad. We and the world in which we live do everything we can to avoid any kind of suffering. But beloved, it's not bad from God's point of view, not always. In a fallen world, and this is the part that you really have to Get in mind, in a fallen world, like the world in which we live, the ramifications and the implications of the fall of mankind as expressed in Genesis 3 have wide-ranging impact that we sometimes don't realize. We don't realize how awfully things have been broken. In a fallen world, suffering can be redemptive. And suffering is intended to be redemptive. There will be no redemption at all without some suffering. The cross of Jesus Christ is the ultimate expression of that truth, right? There would be no reconciliation with God, no peace with God, no salvation, had Jesus not taken on the suffering of the cross. And now he asks us to share in some of his suffering in a redemptive way in this earth. So he's basically saying to his apostles, you're going to suffer, but please make your suffering redemptive. Make it count. Trust me in the middle of it. That's what he's urging. Adversity means opportunity. Opportunity to show forth our Lord in all of his glory. And so we have... Several headings underneath this personal persecution. First of all, we have the prediction. The prediction in verses 12 and again in verse 16. The prediction is persecution. He tells them that they're going to be landed up, taken in jail. That's what the word means when he says that they will lay their hands on you. They will deliver you up. This is going to happen to kings and to governors. He tells them in verse 16, this is only even their families are going to be involved in this. And that everyone will hate them. Some of them will even die as a result of all of this. Persecution leading to death. That's your future. And along the way, you'll be hated by everybody. That's a tough message. 
Certainly not the modern message, right? Our modern presentation of the gospel usually goes something like this. If you'll just come to faith in Christ, he will fix everything. All of your marriage problems, all of your financial problems, all of your relationship problems, all of your addictions, all of your money problems, God will take care of them. You just come to Christ and all will be well. And you know what? He may do any and all of those things. He may. But that's not what he promises. Jesus tells it like it is. And what he tells his disciples in John 15, verse 18, the night before he's going to be crucified, he tells them, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Now note the time reference in our passage. Before all this. Before all this. Before all what? That's our time reference in this passage. We saw verses 8 through 11 are speaking of general characteristics of the age that we are currently living in. But now he says in verse 19, before that. So it must be before everything really gets ramped up in the age in which we live. But if you go back to verse 6, you'll see that there Jesus predicts that the temple will be destroyed. And in verse 7, the disciples come along and ask him, well, when is that going to be? And now in verse 12, he says, well, before that, here's what's going to happen. So even before the temple is going to be destroyed in Jerusalem, which is going to happen in A.D. 70, 40 years from the time Jesus is speaking, this is what the disciples can expect. So this must be the time reference that we're looking at here. Rather than being honored in the kingdom of God, they're going to suffer humiliation and persecution. Now, what I love about this is that before any of this happens to the disciples, it happens to Jesus first. Beloved, well, it's really important. When we think about suffering, whether it's the persecution at the hands of others, whether it's just natural disasters that somehow come our way, it's very important to understand that Jesus has been there first. Jesus never sends his followers somewhere that he hasn't been. Jesus was persecuted while he was here on earth, was he not? Jesus was, the crowds, the crowds were there at some points in time, and then later on they would hate him, and they would try to kill him. You remember how all of that happened time after time. They would try and kill him when they recognized what he was really saying that he was God. They would try and stone him, and over and over, John says, but it wasn't his time, and so he escaped, and so he escaped. But they came to hate him. And you know what? His family was in the middle of all this. When he says, brother's going to hate you, he had the same thing going on. His family, at one point in Mark chapter 3, they came to do an intervention because they thought, quote, he was out of his mind. That's not a very... Helpful thing to think your family would think of you, right? In John chapter 7, it tells us that his brothers were telling Jesus, why don't you go down to Jerusalem? And they were urging this at the very time when they knew that down in Jerusalem by that time, Jesus was public enemy number one. He was the one that the Jewish leaders wanted to get, and they wanted to kill him. Why did Jesus' brothers do that? John 7 verse 5 tells us, for not even his brothers believed in him. Wow. Jesus' own brothers are willing to see him killed if it will kind of take away the embarrassment from the family. Incredible. And you'll recall that it was his friend, one of his closest friends, Judas, who made sure that it actually happened. Persecution. Hatred, betrayal, death, Jesus knew it all. Jesus went through it all. He's not asking anything of his disciples that he hasn't been through. So his followers are going to suffer the same fate. And he's letting them know that. They're going to be arrested. They're going to be persecuted. Sometimes even their own families are going to be involved in that. Sometimes it'll be Jewish people who are the persecutors. Sometimes it'll be Gentile rulers and kings that'll be the persecutors. They are, in effect, Equal opportunity victims, right? They're available to anybody. 
which in fact turned out to be the case. The book of Acts tells us all how it all happened. First chapter of the book of Acts, they're waiting, as Jesus had asked them to do, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. They're praying. Chapter 2, the Holy Spirit has come, and Peter preaches this great sermon on the streets of Jerusalem boldly in the middle of, of where they had crucified Jesus. And 3,000 people come to faith in Christ. But then you get to Acts chapter 4. They had been arrested. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and, Paul, Peter and John had preached in the temple and preached to thousands there, and they had healed a beggar. And then in Acts chapter 4, verse 3, it says, and they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Arrest and imprisonment right on schedule, just like Jesus had told them. But look at the result, Acts chapter 4, verse 4. But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men to, uh, came to about 5,000. So in one day, as a result of one thing, 5,000 men plus women and children coming to faith in Christ. Amazing, isn't it? Well, they're released under strict orders not to preach this resurrection of Christ anymore. But of course, they do anyway. And so in Acts chapter 5, verse, 15, verse 18, they were arrested, the apostles, and put them in the public prison. Eventually they're arrested again, and they go out and they pray, and they pray for boldness, and they keep preaching. Acts chapter 6, they appoint some deacons, one of whom was Stephen, and Stephen gets arrested for preaching the gospel. In Acts chapter 7, he preaches a great sermon to the Jewish leaders, and then he is executed, the first Christian martyr. Acts chapter 8, verse 1, and Saul, some guy named Saul, approved his execution. And there arose that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, all happening just as Jesus said it would. Soon after they had executed Stephen, they came after James, and James was thrown into prison, and he was executed. And then they came after Peter, and Peter was thrown into, into prison, and God miraculously released him. It's all in God's hands, is it not? It's all in God's hands. By that time, Saul has become a believer. Acts chapter 9 tells us how all of that happened. So this great persecutor of the church suddenly turns around and becomes the greatest defender of the church. But he is persecuted. All manner of persecution from Jews and Gentiles both. Paul itemizes some of those persecutions. 2 Corinthians 11 Verse 24 and following, you can read about it. And some of the things he says, he was, he was beaten with the uh, 40 lashes five times. And that was enough to kill you one time, let alone five. That, well, you know what that means? That means that most of his life, rest of his life, of his ministry life, Paul was going around with these huge scars on his back. Have you ever seen the picture of that slave from the Civil War with that horrendous group of scars on his back. Paul would have been the same way. He would have had pain from those every day of his life and every night of his existence. He says he was beaten with rods three times. He suffered untold mockery and humiliation. He was jailed almost everywhere he went. Persecution everywhere. He was finally executed by order of Nero himself. Beloved, what do we, what do we take from this? Here's what we are to understand from this. We are to understand that persecution is the normal Christian life. Persecution is the normal Christian life. Paul says this to Timothy. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, he says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Expect it. This is your norm. This is who you are in Christ. You know, the wonderful protection that we've lived under in this wonderful country of the United States has been a great thing, but it has deadened our senses to the reality that persecution is the expectation, not the exception. We just don't understand that because we have been so protected. As a result, we have a lot of people who claim to be Christian, who could never stand the test of persecution. Why? Because they're not real. They just think they are. 
you became a Christian in the first century, you know, one of the things you knew for sure was you were going to be persecuted and the likelihood that you would be killed was pretty high. You claimed Christ knowing that to be the case. Think of those three boys in Babylon, 600 B.C., taken there captive by the Babylonians from their, land, from their homeland in Palestine. And one day the king, Nebuchadnezzar, makes this great image and he requires that the whole country come and gather around this image. And when they play the music, they are to bow down and worship, essentially worshiping him. So they play the music, everybody bows down, but boy, in the horizon now, you can see standing out, there's those three guys out there. Can't miss them because everybody else is bowed down. So their enemies bring them in. Nebuchadnezzar, by that time, had kind of began to like these Hebrew guys because they seemed a little smarter than his own crew. Daniel had been able to tell him, you know, the results of his dream that he had. And so he was kind of favorably inclined toward them. And so he was mad. He was mad that they hadn't bowed down. But he says, look, guys, I'll give you another chance. We'll do this again. We'll play the music. And you remember what those guys said? It's one of the great passages in the Bible. It's one of the great statements of faith in all of Scripture. Here's what they said. They said, if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that we have set up. What they're saying is this, and God can deliver us if he chooses to do so. We don't know whether he chooses to do so or not, but we can tell you this. We're going to worship him whether he does or not. That's faith. See, faith isn't, I get what I want. Faith is, I get what God wants. That's what they're saying. It's not always easy. God spared those three boys. But you go to Hebrews 11, the great faith chapter of the Bible, right? The hall of fame of people who live by faith. And you find Abraham, and you find Moses, and you find, you know, um, some of the other great men of faith, Noah and other great men of faith in the Old Testament. And then you come to verse 35. And in verse 35, it says, there were even some who by faith got their relatives back from the dead. Some people were resurrected. And it's talking about some of the things that happened in the life of Elijah and Elisha, I think, there. But in the middle of the verse, it says, and then there were some who were tortured. And then it goes on, and the rest of the list of people who live by faith are those who were sawn in two, and those who were eaten by lion. Those are, it's all the people that got killed for their faith. It wasn't a question of if you were faithful, you got deliverance. It was a question if you were faithful, you got God's favor. And you ended up in the Bible as someone who trusted him. We need that kind of faith, don't we? We need that kind of faith. John Lennox is a professor at Cambridge University, fairly well-known school. But he's also a devout believer. He wrote a book called Against the Flow. I think, I think it was one of our recommended readings a few months ago, in which he basically uses the book of Daniel to illustrate how do you live in a secular society. As he sees his seculars, the society becoming increasingly more sec secular in, in England, and as we see ours becoming increasingly more secular. And he says this, he says, society tolerates Christian faith in private devotions and in church services, which is slightly starting to change, but it deprecates public witness to the relativist and the secularist public witness to faith in God smacks too much of proselytizing and fundamentalist extremism the story of Daniel and his friends is a clarion call to our generation to be courageous. Not to lose our nerve and allow the expression of our faith to be diluted and squeezed out of the public square and thus rendered spineless and ineffective. Their story will also tell us that this objective is not likely to be achieved without cost. Persecution, beloved, is alive and well and coming to America. So we need to be prepared. 
This is the first thing that Jesus tells his disciples. Persecution is coming. Secondly, but it's not coming without a purpose. It's not coming without a purpose. The purpose is proliferation. So why persecution? Because Jesus is the saddest and he likes to see his followers suffer? No. It's because, once again, the fall, the brokenness of the culture and the society in which we live and the human race of which we are members, the fall has rendered suffering necessary to redemption. And our suffering can be, if we will allow it to be, it can be part of the proliferation of the gospel. You know, from a natural standpoint, you'd think, well, suffering would wipe it out, wipe Christianity out, right? That's what you would think. People don't want to go there. If you're going to suffer for this, why would you do this? But what happened in the first century when persecution became the order of the day? You call what happened, right? Christianity get wiped out? No, it spread like wildfire. Just the opposite of what you would expect. The harder they tried to put it out, the faster it spread. The church father Tertullian said in around 200 AD, he said the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. They were unstoppable. The more you killed, the more they were to be killed. This was the result of the persecution. He tells us the same thing in this passage in Luke. Look at Luke 12. Uh, look, look, Luke 21, look at, look at verse 12 at the end. He says, You will brought up before kings and governors for my namesake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. You know, from our perspective, that looks, persecution looks like tragedy, right? From Jesus' perspective, it looks like opportunity. It looks like an opportunity to bear witness to the greatness of who he is and the greatness of the gospel. Persecution is the way that we can show the world that Jesus is worth it all. I mean, how do you defeat someone who's willing to die? That's a message that resounds that people can't argue. We, we've kind of been brainwashed. And again, this is a little bit of an American trend. We've been brainwashed into thinking the way to get people's attention, the way they get people saved. This, I kind of grew up on this. Get a celebrity, you know, find somebody. We were told when we were in, in uh, school and in clubs and school, go find, you know, the, the cheerleaders and find the, find the athletes and, and, you know, get them in. That's the way to get people saved, get people. Like, find somebody that's successful. Find a guy that you can point to and say, look, he's got, look at his, he's got a great wife, he's got great kids, he has a great job, makes a lot of money. He's, he's, he's a, and you know why? Because he says it's all because of Jesus. Could be. And it hopefully is. But you know what the world says about that? The world says, oh, great. So Jesus is your ticket. I got a different ticket. I mean, good for you, but I got another ticket. I work hard. I got inside information. I know things that other people don't know. I know how to get information and I know how to use it. That's my ticket. You got yours. I got mine. I'll see you at the top. I don't need Jesus. But you give them somebody who can stand up under persecution and say, I'm willing to die for my faith. The world has no answer for that. The world has no answer for that. Time after time, people have come to faith in Christ because they've watched others die. Now, that doesn't always happen, but many times it happens. This is the unanswerable thing that we can do. Suffer persecution for the name of Christ in a way that glorifies him. That's why Paul was so keen, you know. He said in Colossians 1.24, I live so that I can make up what is missing from the suffering of Christ. He realized suffering is redemptive. It says in Philippians 3.10, my, my goal in life is that I might know him, power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. That's powerful. We don't have too many Christians like that today, but we do have a few. You know, people who come to Christ in the Muslim world, they know all about this. Not first century Palestine, but 21st century world. 
Christian magazine a few weeks ago had an article about a young Arab named Ajir, A-J-I-R. He had turned from Islam to Christ when someone shared the true picture of the biblical Jesus. Who is he really? Muslim has, you know, the Islam and the Quran has that kind of half right. When they begin to really understand who Jesus is, sometimes it makes a difference, and it did. And this was a wonderful story. This man had come to faith in Christ because someone was willing to share with him and take the time to explain who Jesus really was and to deal with his objections and to go get the facts. But then there was a footnote to the story. He gave the whole story. And then there was a footnote. Here's what the footnote said. It said, Ajir now lies buried on a hillside in his own native land. He was slain by his own relatives. We can now print his testimony because he can no longer suffer recrimination for it. It's happening even now. This is the thing that points people to Christ. We consider this a tragedy. Jesus considered it normal. Nick... Um, Ripken, you know, he wrote the book, The Insanity of God. I think it was another one of our recommended readings. If you haven't read that, you need to pick up a copy and read it, The Insanity of God. But he went around and he interviewed persecuted people, Christians around the world. And one Russian pastor told him this. He said, persecution for our faith has always been and probably always will be a normal part of life. Just what we expect at another place where he went, and I've forgotten where right now, but uh, they, Christians were routinely thrown into prison for three-year sentences just because they claimed Christ. You know what the attitude was? The younger ones who hadn't done their prison time yet kind of felt bad that they hadn't suffered that persecution yet. I mean, is, is that a, an attitude we can't relate to? Those are people who love Jesus. They know what it means to pay the price. So the purpose is proliferation, getting the gospel out in a way they can't any other way. Thirdly, there's a promise that attaches to this. Now this is, you're going to love this. Maybe you caught it as we were going through. But look at verse 16. I'm sorry, verse 18 of our passage. Not a hair of your head will perish. That's a good promise, isn't it? That's better than the good hands people. They don't promise that. A new fender is about the best they can do, right? Not a hair of your head will perish. That's a great promise. We all want to hang on to that promise, and we should hang on to that promise. But look at the context. What did he say in verse 16? You, they will put to death. And yet in verse 18, not a hair of your head will perish. So which is it? Death or not a hair of your head will perish? Was, was Jesus confused? You know, I, I don't think from one sentence to the next, Jesus got confused. Do you? I don't think so. So what did he mean? How do you explain this? You know, I, I, I don't think the explanation is really all that difficult. Jesus always took the long view, right? The eternal perspective. And the eternal perspective on this is, is really simple. You may lose your life here, but you will never perish in the ultimate sense, ever. Not a hair of your head will perish. Your eternity is secured. I actually think there's a twofold kind of way this works. The first is when he says not a hair of your head will be harmed. I think it's unless he allows it for some greater purpose. Other passages of Scripture make that pretty clear. You can't be touched unless God says it's okay. Read Job 1 and 2. You can't be touched if you're a child of God unless he allows it for some greater purpose. That's pretty good assurance, isn't it? And if the worst happens, and whatever it is that touches you costs you your life, 
you will immediately experience 2 Corinthians 5.8. Absent from the body is present with the Lord. Money can't buy that policy, right? That's priceless. And that's what he means when he says, not a hair of your head will perish, not in the ultimate sense. Your eternity is secured. I was going to share an illustration here of my brother, John, and his wife, Anne, lost a little son who drowned a few years ago. It seems like when tragedy happens, people sometimes turn to poetry, and John wrote a wonderful poem, and I realized I'd never be able to get through it, so I chose another one. It's not quite as personal to me, but it means the same thing. At the age of 26, a young lady named Lena Sandell. She was with her father on Lake Vatten in Sweden when a great gust of wind on the, caught the ship that they were on, tossed her father overboard. He was a devout believer, but there he went overboard and he drowned as she was watching. They could not help him in time. So shortly, she wrote this because she was a believer too. And in honor of her father, she wrote this. She said, day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here, trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, whatever he gives me. I have no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure gives unto each day what he deems best. Lovingly, it's part of pain and pleasure, mingling toil with peace and rest. The protection of his child and treasure. You ever think of yourself as the treasure of God? Zephaniah, what is it, 317? I probably got the verse wrong, but read it. He sings over you. You are his treasure. The protection of his child and treasure is a charge that on himself he laid. As your days, your strength shall be in measure. This the promise <clears throat> to me he made. It's a priceless promise. Not a head of your hair of your head will perish. Not until it's the Father's time. It's a good thing to rest in, isn't it? And there are times in life when we need it. Listen. D.A. Carson said it this way. He said, you just live long enough and you'll suffer. You may think you haven't been through it yet, but the time will come. The time will come. One final thing in this passage. The proof, the proof of our faith is perseverance. Jesus adds this note in verse 19. He says, by your endurance, you will gain your lives. He's saying, listen, endure. See it through. Go all the way. Be there at the end. That's how we'll know that your faith that you claim is saving faith. Some will remember the uh, boxing match between Sugar Ray Leonard and Roberto Duran on November 30th, 1980. They had a they had a previous match six months before. Sugar Ray Leonard had the title at the time of the previous match. He was considered a great fighter, but he felt like he hadn't really proven himself yet. Duran was a great puncher, and he thought, I'll go in and punch with him, even though he was basically a, a boxer. So he did, and he lost. And he lost his title. So six months later, when this fight is going to come on, I mean, it was hyped beyond anything, one of the most hyped fights of all time. But this time, Sugar Ray Leonard used a different strategy. Instead of going in and fighting like his opponent did, he chose to fight the way that he knew how to fight. He boxed and he danced and he ran and he was fast and he was quick. And it wasn't very long before he had Roberto Duran totally frustrated. I can still remember, and I'm sure some of you have seen the, the reels of it, some of you guys that are a little bit into boxing, um, you know, at the end of the seventh round, 
Sugar Ray Leonard is feeling so good about himself and, and his ability to stay away from Duran that, that he's, he's in a bunching stance, and all of a sudden he goes like this. You know, just a kid's, a kid's wind-up, like he's going to really hit him. And while he's doing that and he gets Duran's attention focused on this hand, he punches him with the other hand. Duran was completely humiliated. At the end of the next round, before the next round was over, he just, he just walked away. He said to the referee, no moss, no moss, no more. Can't take it anymore. He got a long ways. But he didn't endure to the end. He didn't win the fight. And he lost a lot of respect along the way. So Jesus says, I want you to be there at the end. You'll show that your faith is really real if you're there at the end. He says you do that and you'll gain your life, only that's not what the word actually says. The word doesn't say life. The word is the word soul. It's the word soul. Suke. It's his eternal perspective again. The physical life may be lost, but you will gain your souls. You will be eternally secure. Your eternity is secure. So what is he teaching here? Are we saved by endurance? Is that the message? Never. That is not the message. But the message is this. It's the same message that's spoken throughout the Bible that we've seen time after time and we'll see time after time. Endurance demonstrates that the faith is real. Endurance doesn't create saving faith. Endurance demonstrates saving faith. If you can walk away in the middle, the faith wasn't real. If you're there at the end, the faith was real. Saving faith happens at a moment in time, but it lasts for a lifetime. The proof of saving faith is perseverance. Jesus says it this way in Matthew 10, verse 22. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures, endures to the end will be saved. Saving faith takes every punch. Saving faith doesn't quit in the eighth round. Saving faith says, bring it on. Saving faith persists. It has staying value. A lot of people look good for eight rounds. And then what happens? Somebody hurts their feelings. And bam, they walk away. Somebody does something wrong. Some pastor or somebody that's in leadership runs away with the money. And so they quit. Saving faith, beloved, endures. If you want to go back to the old ways, it showed that the faith was never true. John had this problem toward the end of his ministry. He was in probably in Ephesus at the time. Some people left the church that was going on there. Imagine leaving the church where one of the apostles is the pastor. Can you imagine that? It happened. It, it, it kind of gives me hope when somebody walks away, right? Happened to them. Here's what John says. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would, not, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain to all, they all are not of us. 1 John 2, 19. Saving faith never gives up. It per perseveres right through to the end. Faith believes God no matter what. And I say that with reverence because there are some of you here this morning that are facing harder things than I have ever faced. Persevere. Let your faith show. The Bible says in Revelation 21, this is, this is a challenge verse to me, Revelation 21, 8, no cowards in heaven. No cowards in heaven. It says that. It says those who are cowardly, and then it mentions a few other ones, and it says they'll find their place in the lake of fire. No cowards in heaven. Just people that persevered, just people that were there to the end, just people that endured. So if you're not a Christ follower this morning, the question is this. Would you rather suffer briefly with Christ now? 
or suffer eternity without him later. That's the choice. We beg you with everything that we have, give your life to him now, whatever the cost. It'll be worth it. Paul says the sufferings of this present time will seem like nothing compared to the glory that's to come, Romans 8. If you're a Christian, realize that suffering is part of the deal. It's part of the deal. Maybe nobody told you that when you became a Christ follower, but they should have. It's part of the deal. Look, look with me at Matthew chapter 3. In Matthew chapter 3, Jesus is baptized at the beginning of his ministry. As he's being baptized, the Holy Spirit comes from heaven in the form of a dove, so that everybody can see this is the Holy Spirit. And then the voice of heaven, the, vo the voice of God comes from heaven. The voice of God comes from heaven and says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. That is not, did not happen in my baptism. I'm guessing it didn't happen at your baptism, right? But it happened at the baptism of Jesus. Imagine that amazing happening. From heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. This is Jesus. What an exciting moment, right? That's in Matthew 3, verse 17. The next verse is Matthew 4, verse 1. Sometimes the chapter divisions are unfortunate. Because here's what happens. Jesus goes from that tremendously highlight moment, one shining moment, you know, like they say at the basketball game, one shining moment. And then what does he do in verse, chapter 4, verse 1? Then, right after this affirmation by God, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Get the picture. He is, in, he is affirmed. He's empowered. And then, 40 days of hell. God's love, God's power, then evil, wilderness, hunger, temptation. Listen, if life is going too well, don't worry. It's coming. Expect it. Be ready for it. Someone said to a pastor that I heard one time, he, he had a pastor friend, a mentor friend, who said to him, listen, the best thing you can do is prepare your people for suffering. It's going to happen. It's like Matthew was saying here in Matthew, listen, read my lips. No one is exempt, not even Jesus. No one is exempt. Trials and tribulations are a fact of life. In fact, this is what happens to people that God loves so much that as part of his mysterious and good plan, he gives this to us to turn us into something great. what he does. You've got to trust him. Spurgeon used to tell the story of a woman who was aboard a ship. She was frightened because there was a great storm. Scared to death, but she noticed that her husband, the captain of the ship, calm. No fear. Everything seemed fine. She said to him, how can you be so calm when the waves are coming. It looks like the ship could go down at any moment. Why am I so distressed and you're so calm? He reached up. He took his sword down from where it was hanging. He put it up against her throat. And he said, how come you're not afraid? This sword is sharp enough. I could slay you in a second. She said, well, I'm not afraid of the sword when it's my husband who holds it. He said, I'm not afraid of the storm when it's my father who sends it. Right? Our loving, heavenly father will never do us wrong. So let's trust him. Father, we thank you for this word Thank you for the apostles who were expecting the kingdom and they got exactly the opposite. But they were faithful and because they were faithful, now today we have the word. 
We have the possibility of salvation. We have what we need to be saved and then to live a Christian life. And we wouldn't have that if they hadn't been faithful. Their suffering was made redemptive because they trusted in you. Help our suffering to be made redemptive because we trust in you. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.